Welcome to our second chapter in organizational behavior. And this chapter deals with the topic of organizational culture, socialization, and mentoring. Organizational culture, as you will soon understand or realize, is a huge influencer to the way people behave either at the individual, group, or team level, and organizational level. So before we actually get into considering that tripartite or those three levels, we're going to look at, in this chapter, these contextual variables that really help the firm or help us in the firm as managers to understand why, how, and the outcomes of people's behavior. Okay, so we're going to talk in this chapter and also in chapter three that deals with societal culture about these contextual factors. So if we are to define organizational culture, it says here it's a set of shared, taken for granted, implicit assumptions that a group holds and that determines importantly how it perceives, thinks about, and reacts to its various environments. What that tells us here is that of course there's a import, the importance of organizational culture cannot be underestimated because one, it is relatively common among a group of people or individuals that share that common space known as the organization. And two, very importantly, this contextual variable has a lot to do in determining how those people that happen to exist in the organization, how those people perceive their world, how they think, meaning their attitudes and their values, and importantly, how they behave in various environments, meaning how are they influenced, how are they likely to act across a myriad of environments because of their cultural affiliation. So the importance of culture to organizational behavior cannot be underestimated. Culture is in essence who our people are and that is therefore then demonstrated in the things that they do, the attitudes that they hold, the value systems that they practice and the norms that we see being applied across their behavior in multiple contexts. One of the characteristics of organizational culture is that it's very mobile, meaning that as all new employees come into the organization, they actually learn and are what we use the term acculturized into the organizational culture through the process of socialization. We'll talk about that, in fact, in the next part of the lecture. And this culture that new employees uh, gain or the new culture or the culture that they learn actually influences how they behave. And this influence, you will see, operates on the three levels we discussed before, the individual level, the group or team level, as well as the organizational level. Well, in defining organizational culture, we mentioned that it actually has an influence on how people perceive things, how they think, and also how they behave. And so that culture, the influence of culture, is likely to be seen in both the tangible and the intangible. When we talk about the tangible effects of culture, we most likely are mentioning what we, we term the observable artifacts. Okay, These are like the physical manifestations of culture. And you see in things uh, as simple as the way people dress, right? the types of stories they tell, the language they might use, and also the, the types of ceremonies that they would practice. Think about Xavier University and think about how our culture, our, our uh, university culture is manifested in terms of observable artifacts, okay? So if you look at the types of ceremonies we have, the types of convocation, we have a Black History Month convocation. That is important, the types of, type of speakers that we bring to those conv convocation. Also think about the university in terms of your professors, the way that we dress. Most times you'll see professors at our university being more casual than say other universities. That tells you the type or the approach to teaching that we have. It's more laid back, it's more if you will student friendly rather than kind of more stuffy. So those observable artifacts really are this manif or are the manifestation of the type of value systems of the of the uh, the core norms and the ways that we believe 
those are manifested in the way that we act, okay, and the way that we behave, and the types of stories, and just the things that we do. Those things that you can see, those observable artifacts are that physical manifestation of our culture. Well, while um, observable artifacts are the explicit a layer of organizational culture. There are more implicit layers. And when we talk about implicit layers, we talk about things like values. And values are concepts or beliefs that pertain to some desirable end state that transcend situations and they really guide selection of behavior. What that means is that our value system really is something that we hold within ourselves. And regardless of the situation that we find ourselves in, we are likely to use some types of specific values, some things that we prioritize to guide us in the way that we behave. So you may have a value system, for example, of integrity. You might consider integrity to be very high on your list of things that you want to see accomplished. And because of that, the way that you act in situations is going to be guided by your desire to have or to hold a high level of integrity. You might also have a value system that is keen in terms of sustainability of the environment. That's something that you prioritize. And again, that's likely to guide you as you go about trying to figure out how to behave in certain situations. We can also talk about espouse values. And what espouse values are, are the values that the organization actually states that they prioritize. These are the ones that they come or they claim to actually put at the forefront of their activity. And you'll likely see these things written in their mission statements. It'll be clearly identified. These are the things that we hold there. Many times organizations talk about being green, being sustainable, being a social responsible organization. All of those are what we call espouse values. There can also be what we term enacted values, and enacted values are the values and norms that the organization actually do exhibit and actually pass on to their employees. Now, how are, this, how are these different from espoused values? Well, in situations, in most organizations, you would hope that these would be the same as espoused values. What I say I do is actually what I am practicing. I'm walking the talk, if you will. But in many instances, or in some instances, you have organizations that espouse one type of value, but the values that they enact, the values that the employees actually see from their leadership is quite different from those that are espoused. What do I mean by that? So an organization might actually espouse a value of quality. We're quality driven. This is what guides us. This is what makes us different from our competition. That's an espoused value. But in active value, you might see the leaders, leadership of the organization stating, you know what, we're not going to shut this operation down because there is a concern that our product might be defective. That's gonna cost us too much money. So we're gonna keep working. And as an employee in an organization, you're seeing that. And you're saying to yourself, there's a little bit of dissonance here between what you're telling me that we're supposed to be, or we're supposed to be prioritizing, which is quality, and what we're actually prioritizing, which is financial efficiency or being successful in terms of profit in the short term. And so that, that dissonance here can be problematic for organizations. So you want as an organization to have a high level of correlation between what you espouse, your espouse values, and your enact, excuse me, your enacted values. And the last level of or layer of organization culture is actually the deepest level or layer, if you will, and that's kind of where our culture really is formulated. And it's in these basic assumptions and what it is defined here as it's the organizational values have become so taken for granted over time that they're basically the assumptions that guide our organizational behavior. It's termed the cognitive approach to culture, meaning that this is something that we or exist in our minds, in our heads, and we do not necessarily think about it before we actually do it. It's kind of those things where you ask yourself, or you rarely, I should say, ask yourself, why do I act this way? You act this way because you have these core basic assumptions within you, and they tend to guide your behavior 
automatically. Think of yourself as an individual. There are certain basic assumptions that you have just generally accepted and you don't necessarily think about when you're acting. And because you don't think about them, they tend to guide you in ways that you don't really fully understand sometimes because you are not making it essentially a conscious decision. If I were to ask you, well, why did you do that? You would say, well, well, that's just what you're supposed to do. And that's because your basic assumptions are guiding you at that point. So at the very core, the very, the very uh, innermost level, if you will, of organizational culture is these basic assumptions. This is who we are. We don't really question it. It's just kind of what we've always done. And, 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 and in the case that you see in organizational cultural change, it's really these basic assumptions that have to be tested, that have to be questioned in order for us to have any change in the culture. We next turn our attention to the functions of organizational culture to an organization, of course, to the people in the organization. And there are these four functions. I'm going to go over them briefly. The first one has to do with organizational identity. An organizational culture, a strong organizational culture, gives the members of the organization a specific identity a sense of who they are and what should matter to them. So having that culture tells you to some degree who you are and how you can actually characterize yourself as being part of that organization. If you work for Google, your identity, your culture as an innovative firm gives you an organizational identity, an individual identity as someone who is innovative working for this organization. So that's the first thing, it gives you a sense of identity. Secondly, it gives this the people within the firm a sense of collective commitment. What do we mean by that? Well, when you work for an organization with a strong culture, especially a culture that you are close to, meaning that your individual values are highly correlated with the organizational cultural values, then you set, tend to have a stronger commitment to that organization. And the individuals in the organization tend to be more strongly committed co together collectively to the organization. So that's collective commitment. Thirdly, it gives you a sense of people within the firm, gives them a sense of, a, of stability. What do I mean by that? Well, your culture gives you something to anchor yourself. It tells you who you are and it is a continuous going cons uh, uh, um, element that gives you a level of security. It's very difficult for people to operate in environments that are, uh, that are always changing. Having a culture, having a strong culture really settles you, tells you who you are, what you're supposed to do, and then therefore gives you that level of stability to continue working, knowing clearly what you are, are about and knowing that that is likely to continue to be the same as you go on. And then fourthly, it gives you a, a way of making sense of the world. It helps you in terms of perceiving things, in terms of trying to figure out stimuli in the environment. We're going to talk a little more about that as we get into our second module. But organizational culture really helps people to frame the way, the way they see the world and it helps them to make important decisions as to how they should act in certain instances. Well, we can use this compute, competing values framework to help us to describe four different categories or classifications of organizational culture. And I must say at this point that no company may necessarily fall clearly in any one of these boxes. So companies tend to have more affiliation with one of these than maybe the others. But you can't really say that any one of, of these categories or companies clearly fit in any one of these categories. They, they're seen more as extremes where companies, whereas companies fall in some continuum along the line. So I just wanted to state that at the beginning. The four uh, types that we're going to talk about today are really based on the juxtaposition between an internal focus versus an external focus, as well as flexibility versus stability. So those are the, the four elements, if you will, that we will consider. And we'll compare those elements in determining what type of culture 
organizations can have. We'll start at looking at a clan culture. Clan culture has to do with having an internal focus. So in those types of organizations, they are internally focused, meaning that they're more concerned about their people within their organization that they, than they are concerned with the external environment. And they value flexibility, they value change, they value spontaneity to some degree, more so than stability and control. It says here the thrust of a clan uh, excuse me, culture is all about collaboration, collaboration between and among the people in the organization. They do it through cohesion, having participation, having people communicate within the organization. And in the, the end, what they want to achieve is to increase the morale of their people and to develop their people. So that's what we talk about when we discuss a clan culture. A hierarchical culture, that's more about an internal focus, again, just like a clan, but here they're more concerned about control. It's more about efficiency. So they do that through controlling the operations and controlling their people. They do it through having processes, consistency, and they want to achieve, of course, through all of this, efficiency that comes from consistency in performance. Uh, contrast that with a market type um, culture. And in a market type, they're externally focused. They want to be the best, and therefore they are trying to be competitive. They are doing that through their customer focus, productivity. They want to increase market share. And I had ad hocracy culture, well, they're all about creativity, externally focused, but they are trying to do it through well, there are obviously certain outcomes that are associated with organizational culture, certain things that the organization gets or benefits from having an, excuse me, an organizational culture. Uh, from research, we can clearly see that there are certain correlations between organizational cultures and the effectiveness of organizational, meaning how well organizations are able to achieve their goals and how efficiently they're able to do it. And that can help a firm, therefore, one that has a successful and strong culture to promote competitive advantage, to be strategically successful. There's also correlations between the satisfaction of employees, the commitment of employees to organization and organizational cultures, especially clan cultures. Think about clan cultures promoting the well-being of people, the personal development. You will tend to see in those types of organizations, employees wanting to stay with the organization because they feel like they're part of the family. And of course, innovation and quality can also be enhanced or increased because of the cultural promotion of creativity, of flexibility, of development. So in, in terms of clan, adhocracy, and even market cultures, we tend to see these traits, innovation and quality, being promoted and actually being correlated with having these types of cultures. Notice, though, that while organizational culture can, in fact, help in terms of organizational effectiveness, the ability of the organization to be effective and also to be productive, culture, organizational culture, at, at least in terms of what the research has shown, is not necessarily strongly related to organizational financial performance. And that might seem kind of uh, strange to you that you are saying that culture is so important and that financial performance is not strongly related to organizational culture. But why do you think that is? Well, again, think about the competing values framework. The type of culture that you choose is not necessarily what will lead to financial performance. What do I mean by that? In essence, we're not suggesting that a clan culture is better financially for a firm than a market culture. The reality is, going back to chapter one, is that it depends, the contingency perspective. Some organizations are better suited to practice a clan culture and see better results from practicing a clan culture than, than other organizations. Some organizations, because of their environment, because of their industry, need to have a more of an ad hocracy culture. Think about technology firms. They have to be more flexible. They have to be more creative. And so you're going to tend to see in those types of environments, 
organizations that have those types of cultures being more financially successful. Whereas in industry that are more concerned with stability in terms of production, in terms of processes, well, let's say maybe when we're talking about certain types of scientific uh, industry, certain types of uh, uh, pharmaceutical industries perhaps, you will likely see the benefit of a hierarchical culture coming out there. So when you are consistent, when there is a level of efficiency, that helps to promote. Think about Walmart. Walmart is or, or practices a hierarchical culture. That works for them because it allows them to be efficient that lets them create the lower prices. So what we're saying here is that the financial performance is really tied to how best or how well, I should say, your culture fits the demands of your environment. And that's really where you see. So by just simply changing your culture does not necessarily guarantee that you're going to increase your financial performance. And then on the fifth point here, companies with market cultures tend to have more positive organizational outcomes. And the reason why is those companies, remember, are more geared towards being competitive, to making that profit, to being the best. So you're likely to see increased organizational outcomes coming from that type of perspective. And this is just a graphical uh, illustration of some of the things we just mentioned. I mean, you can, you can make sense of this just based upon our discussion so far. So we see here that for job satisfaction, in fact, you have a high correlation between that and a clan culture. And the reason why this relationship, again, is strong is because we mentioned you want to work. People tend to want to work for, for, for clan culture type organizations because it's all about the family. They treat you like, like, like family in those types of organizations. Look at something like um, the quality of products, okay, the quality of products. That's strong for ad hocracy, it's strong for market, strong for client. Again, because they are more focused on being relatively uh, uh, custom oriented or, or flexible. When we talk about, excuse me, when we talk about uh, objective profit, again, we see market and ad hocracy being high there, strong correlates, because they tend to want to promote either competition, either increase in profit share, or creativity, innovation that leads to increased profit. And also when we looked at innovation, well, we should not be surprised that the market, again, and the ad hocracy because of their flexibility, their creativity, tends to support a strong correlation. So we can make sense of these outcomes based upon the type of culture that we've, we're looking at and what this culture prioritizes. Hierarchical prioritizes efficiency, so you won't tend to see necessarily a strong correlation between that and innovation. But adhocracy promotes creativity, and so we tend to see that correlation between that and innovation. So it makes sense to us. Well, while we've discussed the different types of organizational cultures, the reality is many times in order for an organization to actually survive or to become more successful, they do have to uh, uh, go through a process of cultural change. And as we discussed earlier, culture is a very, very secure, a very, very uh, established phenomena in many organizations. And so it's very difficult many times to actually change the culture, to change the way the people think, the way that people perceive things, and, and those, especially those basic assumptions, those things that you don't necessarily even think about. It's very difficult. But there is a process that you can use to go through or to have a successful culture change. And these are some of the points, these are some of the practices that you can use. Formal statements of philosophy, changing those statements, ensuring that you have new mission, a new vision, that people identify with the way that you're doing things now. The design of physical space and work environments. So for example, if you want people to have more collaboration, you might want to break down some of those walls. You might want to actually physically get rid of some of the, some of the barriers between people. Have more exchange just in a way to space. In a lot of these innovative type companies, you have a lot of free space. People don't really have quote unquote offices, if you will. The slogans and the language you use must change. If you're going for, again, a more market oriented culture, you want to see things like customer focus, customer driven, 
being number one. Those are the things, the kinds of language and mottos that you're going to use. Your role modeling and your training. How do you train people? The things that you train on it in, in terms of quality, for example, in terms of innovation. Those things must become prominent in, in, in how you train. Making sure that people are rewarded for doing and practicing the behaviors that go along with your new culture. So making sure that you have people getting rewards and also titles that are being placed on people because of their work. You're trying to ensure and enact this new type of thinking, if you will. Also, you want to change stories and legends that can help you in terms of cultural change, the activities, the goals, the organizational structure, they all go hand in hand in helping an organization to really start questioning and start changing those basic assumptions, start changing the observable artifacts, the espoused values, the enacted values. And of course, most importantly, leadership leadership taking the forefront, supporting the cultural change, transforming themselves, and doing in so doing, transforming the organization. That is key, right?